Greetings, fellow seekers. In this captivating video, we shall embark on a fascinating journey as we delve into an order that in the grand tapestry of history emerged relatively recently. Join me as we unravel the enigmatic manuscripts, uncover the founders, analyze the intricate structure, and unveil the profound wisdom concealed within the sometimes misunderstood teachings of this hermetic order. The path of the truth seeker is hard, winding through the depths of uncertainty, but within its challenges lies the transformative power to awaken the dormant wisdom and illuminate the hidden realms of the soul. The mysteries of our world hold within them profound wisdom and inspiration that transcend time. In our quest for knowledge and illumination, we turn our gaze towards the enigmatic hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. Emerging from the shadows of the late 19th century, this remarkable secret society wove together ancient occult traditions and esoteric practices, unveiling a tapestry of insights that continue to resonate in the modern world. Bear with me as we go through the creation of the Order and its founders before we delve deeper into its meaningful and enlightening teachings. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was founded in London in 1888 by a group of Kabbalists, Rosicrucians, Freemasons and Theosophists, but it was primarily the brainchild of Dr. William Wynne Westcott, a London coroner and prominent Freemason who envisioned the concept of an esoteric order open to both men and women. It is important to note that women weren't always welcomed in orders within this period. Included with the ciphered manuscripts was said to be a letter signed by a woman named Fräulein Sprengel. Sprengel is now widely known to be a fiction of Westcott's. She was supposed to be a mysterious German adept of an occult order called Die Goldene Dammerung or Golden Dawn in English. The way we can conclude that Fräulein was a fiction of Westcott's is that as it so happens, the magical motto of the mysterious Fräulein Sprengel Sapiens Dominabitur Astris, which translates to The wise person shall be ruled by the stars, was identical to the motto used by Anna Kingsford of the Hermetic Society. Westcott had been a member of Kingsford's Hermetic Society, and it was Kingsford who probably served as the unsuspecting model for Westcott's fictitious Fräulein. Westcott's motivation for this fiction was likely to attract leading Masons of the time who expected any worthwhile fraternal organization to have a respectable pedigree. Many such Masonic groups have a long tradition of tracing their hereditary roots back to the esoteric societies and mystery religions of earlier times, to the 16th century Rosicrucians, the medieval Knights Templar, the ancient Israelites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and even the inhabitants of Atlantis, lost in the mists of time. Westcott further secured the aid of two other Masonic Rosicrucians, Dr. William Robert Woodman and Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, to help further develop the rituals and curriculum for his new order, which materialized in February 1888, when the Isis Urania Temple in London was inaugurated and the Golden Dawn was born. For the first four years, the Golden Dawn was one cohesive group later known as the First Order, or Outer Order. A Second Order, or Inner Order, was established and became active in 1892. The Second Order consisted of members known as Adepts, who had completed the entire course of study for the First Order. The Second Order was formally established under the name Order Rosé Rubéé et Aureae Crucis, the Order of the Red Rose and the Golden Cross. By the mid-890s, the Golden Dawn was well established in Great Britain, with over 100 members from every class of Victorian society. Many celebrities belonged to the Golden Dawn, such as the actress Florence Farr, the author of Sherlock, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the Irish poet William Butler Yeats, the Welsh author Arthur Macon, and the English authors Evelyn Underhill and Alistair Crowley. In 1896 or 1897, Westcott broke all ties to the Golden Dawn, leaving Mathers in control. It has been speculated that his departure was due to his having lost a number of occult-related papers in a hansom cab. Apparently, when the papers were found, Westcott's connection to the Golden Dawn was discovered and brought to the attention of his employers. He may have been told to either resign from the order or to give up his occupation as coroner. Mathers was the only active founding member after Westcott's departure. Due to personality clashes with other members and frequent absences from the center of lodge activity in Great Britain, however, challenges to Mathers's authority as leader developed among the members of the Second Order. 
Although some of the order's history is controversial, there is no doubt that the teachings that the order is based upon contain within them many profound ideas which can guide and enlighten us. Now let's take a moment away from history and look at the structure of the order and the philosophical meaning underlying it. Inheritor of a dying world, we call thee to the living beauty. Wanderer in the wild darkness, we call thee to the gentle light. Long hast thou dwelt in darkness, quit the night and seek the day. With these poetic and deeply symbolic words, the three principal officers in the neophyte grade ceremony ritually bring the candidate into the Order of the Golden Dawn. The Order's structure is characterized by the embodiment of three orders, with the pinnacle of attainment bestowed upon the esteemed Third Order. The foundational bastion, known as the First Order, housed a meticulously crafted system comprising six distinct grades. Subsequently, the enigmatic path of ascent unfolded through the veils of the Second and Third Orders, each adorned with three distinctive grades, elevating the seekers to ever greater heights of spiritual realization. The structure of the order followed the archetype of the Tree of Life, which is seen in the Kabbalah and many other mystical traditions. The Tree of Life, a profound symbol within esoteric traditions, manifests as a comprehensive diagram encompassing 10 or 11 nodes, each representing distinct archetypal principles. These nodes are interconnected by 22 lines, forming an intricate network that weaves together the tapestry of cosmic forces. Often arranged into three vertical columns, the nodes symbolize their shared affiliation within a particular category, harmoniously showcasing the interplay of spiritual energies within a unified framework. The distinction between the three categories is one of quality and density of substance, representing different type levels of consciousness, the lower worlds being interpenetrated or held by the higher worlds. The first of these categories is a triad which consists of Kether, the crown, Chokma, wisdom, and Bina, understanding. These three subcategories deal with that which is supremely divine, the superconscious. The whole category is explained as an exalted condition of consciousness rather than of substance, an essence or spirit that is everywhere and at all times expressed in terms of light. The second triad consists of Chest, mercy, Gedula, greatness, and Sephira, beauty, or harmony. This triad is the triad which represents the consciousness of all beings within the cosmos, and it is given birth to from the first and ultimate triad. And finally, the third triad consists of Netzach, victory, Hod, splendor, and Yisod, the foundation. Here we enter the elemental sphere, where nature's forces have their sway. It is also the region in the human sphere of what we may term the unconscious. The magical tradition classifies this unconsciousness into several strata, and to each of them is attributed some one of the four elements, fire, water, air, and earth. Pendant to these three triads is Malkuth, the kingdom, referred to the element of earth, the synthesis or vehicle of the other elements and planets. Malkuth is the physical world, and in man represents his physical body and brain, the temple of the Holy Ghost the actual tomb of the allegorical Christian Rosenkreutz. The difference between these three triads is one of dimension. Besides representing different type levels of consciousness, the lower worlds, or Sephiroth, being interpenetrated or held by the higher. At its core of the whole representation of the tree lies the sublime notion that the very essence of this vast universe finds its origins in the boundless radiance of Ein Sof Auer, the limitless and infinite light from which the entirety of existence unfurled. Embracing this sacred insight, the Golden Dawn envisions a divine destiny, wherein all life and every sentient being, inexorably and ultimately, shall find their sacred journey culminating in a joyous reunion with that very divine source from whence they originated. In other terms, the initiate of the Golden Dawn aims to go through the three sections represented in the Tree of Life, the unconscious, conscious, and finally reaching the ultimate superconscious, which can be compared to a concept such as enlightenment in Buddhism and Satori in Zen. The whole transformational journey is beautifully elucidated in Dr. Evans Wentz's remarkable work, The Tibetan Book of the Dead. This sacred passage leads to the profound realization of the unconditioned Dharmakaya, the sublime embodiment of divine truth, the primordial state of uncreatedness transcending the confines of the mundane. Within the depths of the human psyche, this radiant essence finds expression, 
residing in the most profound recesses of the unconscious, an awe-inspiring force often referred to as the higher and divine genius within the realms of certain magical systems. To continue with the story, students or initiates in the Golden Dawn structure were expected to learn the basics of occult science before proceeding to the next fundamental step, practical magic. Advanced members were expected to practice and become skilled in the high magical arts. It was this aspect of the order that set it apart from purely theoretical study groups of the period, such as the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, from which the Golden Dawn borrowed much of its structure. The practical magic of the Golden Dawn covers many areas, banishings, invocations, purifications, talisman consecrations, divinations, meditations, evocations, spy ritual development, scrying and visionary work, elemental, planetary and zodiacal magic, cabalistic magic, Enochian magic, assumption of god forms, manipulation of the astral light, and more. All of these methods were employed to give the Golden Dawn student a broad working knowledge of the entire magical process. However, the ultimate objective of magic within the Order's framework was inner alchemy, the continual purification of the student's lower personality and the realization of an elevated state of consciousness wherein the magician's psyche gradually enters into a union with the higher self and eventually with the higher and divine genius. This is a process of high magic theurgy or God working. Within the various spiritual traditions, this primary goal has been described in many ways. The completion of the great work, the magnum opus, enlightenment, knowledge and conversation with the holy guardian angel, samadhi, illumination, satori, and self-realization. In the neophyte ceremony of the golden dawn, it is called the search for the quintessence, the stone of the philosophers, true wisdom, perfect happiness, the summum bonum. The magical rituals practiced within the Golden Dawn are imbued with dynamic methodologies of high magic, skillfully crafted to induce a profound psycho-spiritual transformation within the aspirant's consciousness. The officiating officers employ the power of visualization and intention to breathe life into a myriad of symbols and correspondences invoking the sublime spiritual forces linked to them. Through adept manipulation of the currents of the astral light and the deliberate harnessing of faculties such as willpower, visualization, and imagination, these ceremonies acquire a resplendent magical potency, bestowing upon them a captivating and transformative essence. Over time, the illustrious hermetic order of the Golden Dawn gradually underwent a lamentable corruption straying from its noble pursuit of enlightenment. Regrettably, influential figures like Aleister Crowley drew excessive media attention, thereby diluting the Order's true essence. The indiscriminate acceptance of new members fostered a deterioration, permitting the infiltration of occult practices that deviated from the pristine intentions encapsulated within the original manuscript. It is indeed ironic that the figure which brought back the focus to the more illuminating practices and ideas of the order was a man by the name Francis Israel Regardi. Raised in an Orthodox Jewish household within the humble environs of London's East End, Israel Regardi and his family later embarked on a journey across the Atlantic, settling in Washington, D.C. in the United States. As a teenager, Regardi embarked on a transformative path, distancing himself from Orthodox Judaism and immersing himself in the realms of Theosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jewish mysticism. It was through his exploration of yoga that he chanced upon the profound writings of the enigmatic occultist Aleister Crowley. Intrigued, Rigardi reached out to Crowley, eventually receiving an invitation to assume the role of the occultist secretary, leading him to relocate to the vibrant city of Paris, France, in the year 1928. Upon his return to the United States in 1937, an altruistic impulse seized Israel Regardi. Fueled by an earnest concern that the profound system of ceremonial magic within the Golden Dawn would fade into obscurity, he embarked on a daring endeavor. In a series of books published between 1938 and 1940, aptly titled The Golden Dawn, Regardi fearlessly unveiled the sacred rituals of the Stella Matutina. However, this noble act necessitated the relinquishment of his sworn oath of secrecy, subsequently arousing the ire and disapproval of numerous occultists who perceived his disclosure as an affront to their esteemed traditions. 
Even in the present era, the resplendent legacy of the Golden Dawn system which is laid bare in this book endures as a pinnacle of excellence, standing unwavering as one of the most refined and cohesive systems of Western ritual magic ever conceived. Its profound teachings, meticulously structured curriculum, and meticulously crafted rituals have garnered profound admiration from practitioners and scholars alike. Moreover, the influence of the Golden Dawn extends far beyond its own realm, as its venerable curriculum has provided an indispensable foundation and a veritable springboard for numerous other magical groups and orders. The seeds of inspiration planted by the Golden Dawn continue to blossom, permeating the tapestry of contemporary magical practices, ensuring that its wisdom and profound techniques remain an integral part of the mystical landscape. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to see more videos like this, please consider liking and subscribing. You can also click the link in the description to purchase a copy of the book, The Golden Dawn, which contains the whole sublime teaching of the Order.